Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to session eight. Um, I'm James Smith. This session is clinically driven and transformational history challenges and opportunities. There's going to be a slight change to the running order today. Um, so all of the speakers are going to be here. But instead of starting with the um, catapult cell and gene therapy, we're actually going to start with our keynote, which is Professor John Fallowfield. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Fallowfield. He's principal investigator in the Center for Inflammation Research at the University of Edinburgh. And he's an honorary consultant technologist at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, looking after patients with a range of chronic conditions. Um, so Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this exciting meeting. I, I do feel like uh, a bit of an interloper, to be honest. Uh, I'm an academic engineer at all, but I am convinced that state-of-the-art bioengineering approaches have the potential to close the translational gap in deliver delivering more efficacious therapies for people with chronic liver disease. These are my declarations. I can hear everyone speaking in the green room. I think right now. I'll have to, no, I'll have to come out of my presentation to do that. Okay, thanks. Sorry, these are these are my uh, these are my declarations. My talk today is focused on a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. And uh, NAFLD's now the commonest cause of chronic liver disease and rising. It's the liver expression of metabolic syndrome affecting up to patients and 70% of patients with type 2 diabetes. It represents a spectrum ranging from isolated fatty liver or steatosis to NASH or steatohepatitis, where there's fat and inflammation. Through increasing amounts of fibrotic scarring, potentially culminating end-stage cirrhosis and liver cancer. And importantly, disease progression indicated by these green numbers here is highly variable and as yet completely unpredictable. So that out of every 100 patients with NAFLD, only about 5% will develop cirrhosis. But the transition to NASH is important as this is associated with an increased mortality rate, although it should be noted that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in these patients. The global burden of NAFLD is high, affecting one in four adults with a substantial healthcare and socioeconomic burden. And you can see some of the uh, statistics here. There's a significant geographical variation in prevalence, being highest in the Middle East and South America and the lowest in Africa. And this variation is not just driven by caloric intake, other factors, including genetic modifiers such as the PLA, PNPLA3 risk variant, are also important. A consistent and important finding across several independent studies is that liver fibrosis stage, but not NASH per se, predicts outcomes in people with NAFLD. And this is shown very clearly here in this Kaplan Meyer plot with a dramatic increase in mortality 
as the severity of fibrosis increases, going from uh, F0, which is no fibrosis, to F4, which is cirrhosis. What about treatment? Well, although weight loss through either diet or bariatric surgery improves insulin sensitivity and can reverse NASH and even fibrosis, most find it hard to achieve and sustain. That said, you can see data here from a very um, important study showing that if patients can lose above 10% body weight, NASH pretty much melts away and fibrosis regression is substantial. However, the race is on for the first approved medical treatment for NASH, and it's a multi-billion dollar race. And in terms of current drug activity, um, patients with active NASH and moderate fibrosis are the main target population, as they're the most at risk of developing clinical outcomes. NASH pathogenesis is currently viewed as a model of substrate overload, whereby steatosis results from an increase in free fatty acid delivery to the liver and from de novo synthesis of free fatty acids, and they're both substrates for triglyceride synthesis. Liver injury may accompany steatosis due to oxidative stress, cell stress, and activation of the innate immune system. Liver cell injury and death triggers and perpetuates inflammation. And fibrogenesis due to inflammation leads to progressive liver scarring. Now, the microbiome appears to play a major role in NAFL progression as well through different mechanisms, including immune activation via tolite receptors and potentially endogenous alcohol production by the gut bacteria. Accordingly, this pathogenic model has served as a very useful framework for NASH therapies, targeting completely different NASH pathogenesis, such as inhibiting de novo lipogenesis, reducing lipotoxicity or cell injury, or inhibiting inflammation and fibrosis. Now, modulation of the microbiome could play a role in our future therapeutic armamentarium, but much more precision will be required about how to target it. This slide, which is nearly two years old now, and therefore would probably be even busier today, helps to visualize the vast array of drugs targeting distinct mechanisms shown around the circle here and moving through different stages of clinical development from out to in. And you'll notice that there are very few drugs in the bullseye, which is phase three, and also that metabolic focus therapies form by far the largest group. The so-called NASH graveyard is increasingly littered with a growing number of failed trials and terminated drug programs, especially in NASH-related cirrhosis, which to date seems recalcitrant to treatment. And these disappointments can at least in part be attributed to a lack of physiologically relevant and predictive preclinical NAFLD models that translate to humans. So the current approach isn't working. Indeed, successfully modeling all the key physiological events from steatosis to inflammation and fibrosis that's evident in clinical NASH has been extremely challenging in both in vivo animal models and in vitro cell-based ones. Furthermore, researchers are realizing it's unlikely that a single one-size-fits-all wonder drug will be discovered. Consequently, many pharmaceutical companies are shifting their R&D efforts towards combination therapies, making an extremely expensive bet that their preclinical models will accurately predict the best combinations to test in the clinic. Combination drug therapy is a common strategy for different conditions such as cancer. And because the pathophysiology of NASH is complex, involving multiple pathways, metabolic, inflammatory, and fibrotic, a polypharmacy approach seems logical. Accordingly, useful combinations would be expected to be synergistic or additive, leading to greater potential efficacy, but with pharmacokinetic considerations and an increased risk of toxicities. Current combinations are empirical, however, and we need a systematic approach to identify optimal complementary mechanisms of action using human data and leveraging computational approaches. And a palette of different combinations would open the door to tailoring of treatment according to the predominant pathophysiological drivers, the stage of NASH, comorbidities. To date, most NASH therapeutics have been tested for efficacy and toxicity in mouse models prior to being advanced to clinical trials. 
and more than 20 different mouse models have been used to study NASH, and they range from high-fat diets to methionine-choline deficient diets, genetically altered models, or some combination or adaptation thereof. And each of these models has specific pros and cons. For instance, some, uh, like the MCD diet model, has an absolute absence of obesity and insulin resistance. But for animal models, scalability and time continue to be major limitations. And in many of these models, you don't see any fibrosis for six, uh, at least six months um, of model evolution. And I've highlighted the Gubra and Diamond mouse models here, as they probably display the best clinical translatability with respect to the histopathological, transcriptional, and metabolic aspects of the human disease. Due to the high costs and the time required for animal testing, there's a growing interest in in vitro models of NASH, particularly for early preclinical screening of single or combinatorial therapies. And to meet the needs of today's pharma drug discovery efforts, in vitro NASH models must, if possible, exhibit the following characteristics. They should re recreate disease progression across the NAFL spectrum, maintain longevity to facilitate chronic drug exposure, recapitulate human pathway perturbation and responses to disease modulators, and show reproducibility and ideally, gener um, ideally generate clinically relevant NASH readouts, ones that can be measured at scale using high content, high throughput assays. Two-dimensional monocultures of primary hepatic cells and cell lines have long been used to model diseases and to develop drugs. However, they ignore the contribution and the interplay of other liver cell types essential for NASH initiation and progression. And in general, they have a limited ability to reproduce gene expression and metabolic activity that's observed in vivo. There are specific limitations too. Hepatocyte cultures, whilst useful for studying lipid loading or de novo lipogenesis, have other drawbacks. Primary human hepatocytes are hard to obtain, they're expensive, there's significant donor variability, and they de-differentiate de quickly and lose metabolic function within a couple of days. Primary rodent hepatocytes exhibit species differences in drug metabolism, um, uh, drug targets, and in pathophysiology. Um, uh, Human hepatic cell lines like the HEP-G2 um, line simply lack the full repertoire of metabolic capabilities. And uh, human IPS, uh, IPSC, um, pluripotent stem cell derived hepatocyte like cells often exhibit an immature phenotype. However, IPSC hepatocyte like cells and HEPRG cell lines are more physiologically relevant surrogates of primary human hepatocytes. Um, hepatic stellate cells and stellate cell lines are also valuable for studying the fibrotic aspects of NASH following spontaneous activation on plastic. The main issue I've encountered with primary hepatic stellate cells is donor variability again, whilst although hepatic stellate cell lines grow quickly and have a more homogeneous phenotype, they possess differences to primary human cells, including, including a complex carrier type. It's now possible, though, to incorporate multiple human liver cell types along with complex biochemical and biomechanical microenvironments to better mimic in vivo pathophysiology. And these next generation models are driving a greater understanding of the underlying mechanisms and the progression of disease and should in turn help identify better drug candidates with improved safety and efficacy uh, profiles to advance to clinical trials. Additionally, they may help to address the poor correlation between clinical and animal data while imp implementing the three R's of animal research. The variety of in vitro approaches are highlighted here in this diagram, and this is an excellent review I'll draw your attention to. They show here from left to right a microfluidic, perfused, three-dimensional human liver model, a scaffold-free liver-on-chip model with multi-scale organotypic cultures, a very large scale liver lobule on a chip model showing the fabrication of liver lobules, an artificial liver sinusoid with a microfluidic endothelial like barrier for primary hepatocyte culture, and a perfused multi well plate for 3D liver tissue engineering. A number of companies have products in this space shown in the table on the right that are either static or dynamic perfused models. Some of you may recognize these, um, these products. We're hoping to bring the emulate system into Edinburgh, which is a, a microfabricated PDMS chip. 
and we plan to use the emulate uh, chip chassis to develop a bespoke liver on chip NAFLD model. One neat model I want to highlight is this in vitro human liver system that mimics human NAFLD under lipotoxic stress. The model illustrated here was engineered to incorporate hepatic sinusoidal flow and lipotopic, lip, lipotoxic stress risk factors, namely glucose, insulin, and free fatty acids with co-cultured primary human hepatocytes, hepatic stellate cells, and macrophages stained here in the top middle. Transcriptomic, lipidomic, and functional endpoints were evaluated, and pathway activation appeared to correlate with clinical data from NASH patient biopsies shown in the table top right. The lipotoxic milieu promoted hepatocyte li lipid accumulation, increased glucose output with decreased insulin sensitivity, and increased inflammatory markers such as ALT shown here in the graph in the middle, and fibrogenic activation markers including secreted TGF-beta, extracellular matrix gene expression, and hepatic stellate cell activation, evidenced here by alpha-smooth muscle actin staining in the panel next door. Consistent with clinical trial data, exposure to the FXR agonist drug abetacolic acid in this model reduced hepatic steatosis and also inflammatory and fibrotic secreted factors shown here at the bottom, but it also decreased, sorry, it also increased AP ApoB secretion, suggesting a potential adverse effect on lipoprotein metabolism. An alternative to using primary liver cells is shown here, whereby potent stem cells were used to generate reproducible multicellular human liver organoids comprising hepatocyte-like cells, Kupfer cells, and hepatic stellate cells. Free fatty acid exposure induced a profibrotic NASH phenotype. And organoid stiffness could be measured using atomic force microscopy, a really nice clinical corollary, I think, and reflected fibrosis severity. And in a really uh, fascinating exemplification of this model, a therapeutic increase in FGF19, again following a betacolic acid, reverse the NASH phenotype in Wolman disease derived organoids. Now Wolman disease is caused by the defective activity of lysosomal acid lipase and hepatocytes from patients with Wolman disease have massive lipid accumulation accompanied by lethal steatohepatitis and fibrosis. We've gone down the stem cell route in Edinburgh and Professor David Hayes group have generated an automated system for 3D stem cell derived liver sphere production. The production pipeline is shown here, whereby human pluripotent stem cells are differentiated into hepatic progenitors, um, endothelial cells, and hepatic stellate cells, and self-assembled into liver spheres. These can be manufactured in 96-well format with around 70 spheres per well. Cytochrome P451A2 activity from hepatoendothelial liver spheres and hepatoendothelial stellate liver spheres is shown here in the graph. We can treat these spheres with an optimized fatty diet to mimic NAFLD and NASH and subsequently expose them to varying compounds and combinations and the effects on steatosis, inflammation and fibrotic markers can be quantified. It would be remiss of me uh, in an engineering uh, conference to not mention some other uh, modalities, one being human precision cut liver slices, which in expert hands can be cultured for up to seven days with gentle rocking. Here, in a bioreactor using a semi-permeable transwell insert setup and channels effectively drilled between paired wells. The induction of fibrogenesis in normal precision cut liver slices is achieved with stimulation from TGF-beta and PDGF-beta. And that's shown here by uh, uh, the graph, which shows collagen one expression during culture. And then interestingly, it's possible to um, study different antifibrotic compounds and measure collagen one expression again. Uh, it's possible to lipid load these generate early stage NASH and therefore drugs can be tested for their ability to reduce steatosis, inflammation and fibrosis using multiple readouts like histology and ELISA. In addition, whole liver decellularization by perfusing detergent to create this kind of ghost-like structure on the right create compatible scaffolds for tissue engineering. Indeed, as you've heard from other speakers, that the native liver extracellular matrix may provide a superior microenvironment for hepatic cells in terms of adhesion, survival, and function. 
I'm not aware thus far, though, that these scaffolds have been used to model Nash. As I mentioned earlier, leveraging human data is crucial to inform and validate preclinical model development. We've created a large pan Scotland data commons for NAFLD research called Steatocyte. And Steatocyte consists of around a thousand cases comprising needle biopsy, resection, and explant liver samples obtained from the Scottish Biorepository Network. The samples were recut, stained, and analyzed using digital pathology, and thick tissue curls were processed for bulk RNA sequencing. Linked clinical data was extracted from the electronic health record. And the entire multi-dimensional data set is incorporated into the Steatocyte platform for downstream applications, including bioinformatics and artificial intelligence. Yes. Oh. It's still on my screen. But how do I? Okay. Can I end show and start again? Hi, sorry, everyone. There's a, a bit of a technical problem with the screen share. They're just sorting it out um, in the background. So we've got um, the, the experts um, just sorting them out. Um, so I think something went wrong with Jonathan's screen share. Um, but it looks like it's coming back. I can still see him. Um, I know the rest of you can't. And he's just trying a couple of things to bring back the slides. Um, just just while that's happening, um, just to tell you about the slight change in order. Um, straight after this, we're going to have the sponsor talk, um, which will be from the um, Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. And then after that, we'll progress through the other four speakers in, in the session. So slight change of plan. And apologies for the, the technical hitch. Um, and I think if we just wait a moment, they, they should get that organized. I think he's coming back. To reactivate screen sharing. So I'm looking at my slides, but you're not. So what I was going to show you and what I'm looking at is um, uh, is how we've analyzed the sequencing data. And I, I was showing a, a heat map and principal component plots um, showing how uh, we've begun to separate the transcriptional profiles uh, for patients at different stages of um, disease. And then we're using pathway network analysis and in silico mapping of prior, prior targets um, to look at drug target databases. And then we have a high content screening uh, combination analysis toolbox that I was going to show. Um, and then finally, I was going to end by saying that um, we've begun to analyze the, the bulk hepatic RNA-seq data from Steatocyte um, by using another engineering approach. Um, so after the, after the bioinformatic and computational analyses um, have provided us with druggable targets and with genes whose expression we need to track, we can also employ a feedback control approach using a cyber physical system. And this has been developed in Edinburgh by Lucia Bandieri and um, Bandiera and Filippo Melanoshina. Uh, and we've been working with them to use their platform that can is fluorescence microscopy and microfluidics to determine the best combination of drugs to revert the pathological state back to the physiological state. And then my final slide was just a takeaway slide, really. 
just to say that NAFLD is a, a complex disease with a growing prevalence and costly impact on society. It has a variable no qualified biomarkers and no approved drug therapies. And it's important that the most promising drug candidates are accurately validated with physiologically relevant preclinical models before we advance them into expensive and lengthy clinical trials, many of which seem to be failing at present. Uh, we need to adopt a human data-driven approach um, uh, through resources like steatocyte. And then these multicellular models, which I've, I've, I've briefly touched upon, and bioengineering methods like organoids and liver on chip are going to be really important, I think, to um, add uh, complexity and translatability to our preclinical pipeline. And I think it's going to these these uh, models are going to continue to improve as we add systemic components like inf infiltrating blood immune cells or microbiome components into the mix, and then uh, incorporation of real time clinically aligned biosensors to monitor the biological responses is probably the ne the next thing down the line. And I was going to acknowledge um, some. Uh, attractive uh, faces on my final screen, uh, a load of engineers that I, I work with increasingly and collaborate with, and people in drug discovery, and then people that have funded our work like Innovate UK, Guts UK, MRC, etc. And just flag up things like Organ on Chip Technologies Network, um, Precision Medicine Scotland, and other partners. And uh, I'll stop there because uh, probably me talking with no slides is uh, not helpful. That was great. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And um, sorry for the technical problems, but I think you recovered really well. I could I could imagine what you were what you were showing us um, as as you talked about it um, towards the end. Um, <clears throat> so, do if you do have questions for Jonathan, please type them into the um, in, into the live Q and A. Um, ju just to start us off, I mean, towards the end there, you were talking about how your it, your, your, your vision for really kind of bringing the human data approach together with some of the new technologies and models and that kind of thing. So am I right in thinking that, that, that you feel like actually now things are really improving in this area? You've now got some of the tools that will really help to, to ad advance things? Or do you feel like there's still a real kind of critical gap in, in, what, in what you can do at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to articulate that. Um, uh, the, the, it's easier to, to, to kind of demonstrate, but effectively what we're doing is, um, I mean, hepatology, we're just uh, decades behind some other um, disease areas. And actually, I'm working increasingly with people in cancer uh, drug discovery and cancer biology who seem to be way ahead of us in terms of in silico drug discovery, um, uh, taking big data, big human data sets, and using that to interrogate um, drug databases, for instance, and then using um, uh, you know complex computational uh, methods to to work out which drugs can uh, correct which um, dysregulated gene expression pathways. So, I think we uh, we're getting better, but there are there are, there are people in other in other areas who are much better at this than we are. So I'm trying to learn from them, to be honest. That sounds good. Um, this. There's a, a couple of questions about um, about the, um, the kind of technical aspects. So one of the things you mentioned, you, you were you were choosing or you're moving towards using the emulate model. I think you mentioned for as an organ on a, a chip. Um, could you just say something more about that and why that one in particular is the model that you think is is most appropriate for your use? <laughs> Uh, right. Well, the, the first disclaimer is not actually my specific choice, but um, uh, I, I, I have colleagues in Edinburgh who are part of the Organ on Chip network, and uh, they, they, they have, they have um, some contacts uh, at Emulate. So we were looking at the Emulate system. I kind of, I think any system is best if it has um, flow and microfluidic. Um, incorporation so that and it has this um ability to separate uh, different cell populations in different layers and that crosstalk i think is really really important so i think the feeling was that the the emulate chassis gave us the kind of building blocks if you like to then make it bespoke uh, how we wanted it so we can incorporate flow we can use 
whichever cells we like, whether that's um, spheres or whether we make uh, a different multicellular combination of cells and incorporate into the emulate chassis. So I think it was more that it was a dynamic model and there was so, there was certainly some people who are very keen to use it locally. So uh, I'm, I'm on board with that, but I don't have any particular kind of uh, loyalty to, to, to any specific brand or, or company or make. It just so happens that's the one they seem to have gone for. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that kind of answers one of the questions that, that came through from Buzzer as, as well about um, whether there are approaches using, um, um, oh no, actually there's a question, are there, are there any approaches using organoid in lab on a chip or fluid bioreactor? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's obviously the next, the next stage uh, and what people are trying to do. Um, so org organoid on a chip essentially. So yes, I think that's what people are doing and they're not just done it for liver, they've been doing it for other things as well. I think it, um, it's easier to, for, for, for me, uh, conceptually, it's easier to deal with a, a sphere of cells in a well than it is with lots of spheres in a, in a chip. Um, but I, I, I think that's the direction of travel. But I think it would be difficult, be complex to try and adapt some of these um, multicellular models, sorry, cellular aggregates into those kind of devices but i i think that's the next that's the next uh, challenge really thank you another question in the in the chat um thank you for this very interesting talk i was wondering if you have any explanations as to why it is so difficult to recapitulate the full cholesterol metabolism including in, in the emulator and that's from owen uh well the <laughs> There are there are more sophisticated um, types of hepatocyte um, I've seen on where functionality and a lot of the pathways you know in lipid metabolism metabolism are very well preserved. So uh, people have reprogrammed uh, much more immature hepatocytes into more adult-like hepatocytes, which appears to bring with it better functionality. So I think, I think there's work to do in uh, tweaking the hepatocyte, which I think is the key cell here in terms of um, obviously lipid loading and lipid uh, lipotoxicity. So I think we are going to be in a better position to recapitulate some of these complex uh lipid metabolism pathways i just think that some of the cells that we're using maybe don't don't quite reflect what the primary human cells are doing and particularly not in vivo that's great thank you okay i think i think we better stop there and just say um thank you very much again jonathan for a, a brilliant keynote this is really fascinating work and it's it's been really great to hear from you today apologies for the technical hitch um no i'm sorry i, I, I don't know whether i i when i moved a slide i touched something i, I don't know it, we, it, we I, I think we we still um got really um got the message and got to hear um the content of what you were what you were presenting so thank you very much thanks um, everyone so now we're going to, um, in a slight change in, in order, we're going to move on to the um, sponsor talk. Um, and this is from Asamina Panzani, um, Mina from the um, Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. So, Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you very much to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present the work that we do at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. Uh, my name is Asimina Pantazi and I am the Business Development Executive for UK North at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. So I would like to talk to you about the work that we do and what we're all about. Uh, the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult is a non-for-profit organization that is established by Innovate UK. Uh, we are part of a, a leading, world-leading catapult network of uh, technology and innovation centers that are scattered around the UK. And what we do is trying to bridge the gap between business and academic research. 
And we do this by providing access to technical facilities and expertise to help with the development and the commercialization of innovative cell engine therapies. Our overarching vision is for the UK to become a global leader in the development, delivery and commercialization of those innovative therapeutics and that businesses can feel confident that they can come to the UK and uh, grow here and develop the, their innovative solutions. The mission of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult is to accelerate the commercialization of innovative research. And we do this by working closely with industry and academia. We strive for innovation and we work together with our collaborators from the government, the NHS and the regulatory authorities in order to, to facilitate this uh, initiative, this mission. The Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult uh, has uh, more than 300 specialists that can support uh, with in a number of ways during the commercialization journey of a cell or gene therapy. So the different ways that we can support with are uh, our teams uh, can support with uh, matters in process development, analytical development. Uh, we have our regulatory and clinical teams that can support with uh, regulatory matters when it comes to having those conversations with the regulatory authorities such as the MHRA. Our non-clinical teams can uh, support with developing a preclinical strategy to mitigate the risks and enable a smoother transition to the clinical phase. And our clinical teams can support with the design and the appropriate management of uh, the clinical trials. Also, we have expertise in uh, intellectual property, patent protection, as well as health economics and market access. And the way we're working, uh, we follow three different transactional models. We have the commercial model, which is the standard fee for service model, where the client, the collaborator can uh, pay us for the service and we deliver the work as agreed. We have a collaborative model uh, where we identify and uh, collaboratively apply to grants to carry out work that is of mutual interest for both the catapult, ourselves, and the collaborator. And we have also our core model, which means that on a case by case basis, we may decide to um, to uh, to offer uh, some in kind support in areas that uh, are very well aligned with uh, our strategic priorities in areas in the field, in the, in the cell and, and gene therapy space that are of uh, high unmet need and where there is significant challenge that we also want to, to tackle. Uh, and. Uh, an example of uh, our that operates uh, of program that operates through the core model is our commercialization of research program, for which I'm going to talk to you in more detail a bit later. So regarding our facilities, uh, we have our uh, main labs uh, uh, and where our, our analytical and process development teams are based in London at Guy's Hospital. We have a large manufacturing site at Stevenage uh, where there are uh, a number of clean, of clean rooms that our collaborators can occupy and they can bring their own staff and equipment and uh, use our uh, uh, processes and settings to manufacture their product at scale. Uh, we have a site at Braintree that is uh, currently meant to be used to support the vaccine manufacturing for COVID-19, but in the future, it will become an innovation center for cell and gene therapies, uh, focusing on uh, vi viral vectors. And these are very, very exciting times for the cell and gene therapy catapult because we have just uh, announced the opening of our new offices in Edinburgh, where I'm also based, uh, the BioQuarter campus. So at the moment, we will we are having offices, and in the future, we are planning to open our first laboratories as well, as we're expanding in the north, and we're trying to strengthen the, the ecosystem in the north of the, of the UK. And now I just have a couple of slides focusing on commercialization of research. Uh, we have a, a dedicated team focusing on uh, how to accelerate commercialization of research and how to develop, um, to take um, promising research and uh, develop, it, turn it into investable opportunities. So we're looking at innovative science in the field of uh, cell and gene therapy uh, that has commercial potential and coming from laboratories that uh, would be interesting in, in developing, creating a new company. And our investable opportunity process uh, follows three steps, uh, three stages. Uh, we start with uh, the investable opportunity clinic. So basically what that means is uh, 
our team of experts with uh, different expertise, different backgrounds from the Catapult um, arranges a meeting uh, with uh, and the academic group and they go through their uh, materi uh, materials, results and processes to date. And they identify those areas that are weak, um, areas that may need improvement. They can judge what, what they can evaluate, what goes well, what goes wrong, and they can provide their input into what needs to be done for the group to develop a, a stronger case uh, for uh, in order to, to move faster uh, through the commercialization journey. So basically following that op investable opportunity clinic, our teams at the Catapult can provide a report that outlines uh, all these areas uh, that could be further improved. Following that stage, uh, we can actually collaborate with that group and uh, carry out some of the work that was suggested uh, at stage one. And that could involve paper-based work, such as um, uh, regulatory support or preclinical design, but it could also be uh, wet lab work. And uh, following that, we can also support with uh, bringing um, and together uh, the academics with uh, um, investors, uh, as we have a large uh, network of investors, and we can support them to get ready to prepare for those meetings with the investors, uh, prepare their, tra their their pitching deck, and train to, to 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 feel ready to speak to them. And all this operates under our core model, as I mentioned earlier, which means that this is support that we offer as benefit in kind. And this is an example of the several steps that uh, an academic group may need to go, will need to go through from the moment that they have identified a great differentiated idea to the moment that they have established freedom to operate. And the colored um, stages, the colored items, are the areas that the catapult can support with. For example, uh, we can advise on uh, choosing the relevant in vivo model, we can uh, advise with uh, uh, developing a preclinical strategy. We can uh, help to put together an experienced entrepreneurial team. Um, we can support with uh, uh, identifying the uh, commercial uh, opportunity, the commercial value of the product uh, through our health economics uh, work. So these are steps that often uh, are being missed. And we often try to, to run from uh, identifying the the opportunity uh, and generating some first in vivo in vitro data to uh, all the way to the to the to, to going into clinical trials, but uh, these these steps shouldn't be missed. They're very important in the journey of commercialization. Sorry. And this is my final slide, just to, just to mention to you that uh, currently we have there is an exciting opportunity to apply for this grant that is looking for uh, engineering biology breakthrough ideas. And we're looking for researchers that are interested to apply for the grant. The deadline is at the end of uh, July. So if you think you have an exciting opportunity and you would like to collaborate with us to apply for this opportunity, please get in touch. And I would be very happy to discuss uh, with you your work. Uh, you can find me at the booth. Um, and I would be really, really happy to welcome you there and discuss about the exciting work that you do. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very much, Esamina. And a uh, big thank you to um, Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult for sponsoring the session. They really are great people to work with. Um, I've had some experience of that. Um, huge amount of experience, and there's, it's amazing what, what they can do to help. Um, now, I think we, in the interest of time, we need to, to um, push forwards really. So if you've got questions for, um, for Catapult, there's, there's one quick one appeared. Um, if you could just answer this one, it just says, will this affect first time funding? That was from Roxana. Could you please repeat the question? So the question is, will this affect first time funding? Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Yeah exactly what's being asked there so perhaps the best thing to do roxana is go and go and visit the um the the, the catapult um in, in in the in the other area and um you'll be able to chat all about it so thank you very much for that thank you very um, much now let's move forward to our next talk um so the next talk is laura sydney from university of nottingham um now laura's going to be talking about a novel preservation technique 
for the manufacture of biocompatible and terminally sterilized transplantable human corneas. Hello, Laura. Hi, uh, James. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me and um, you'll be able to see my slides in a minute. Um, OK, so I would take a little bit of this opportunity to talk about some work that my group's been doing um, that's a little bit tissue a little bit regen med but kind of on the outskirt looking at how we can better preserve transplantable corneas basically so that we can store them for a little bit longer so just a bit of disclosure this is a industry collaboration with new vision biotherapies who are a spin out of the university of nottingham so just to introduce the the cornea is the very front of the eye so Damage to um, the cornea can cause horrific and debilitating um, blindness. And this can be through disease or infection, anything like this. And it, and it can then cause costs to the um, healthcare systems. And there's lots of different ways that the cornea can be damaged. And this can be, like I said, through trauma, through disease. What links all these is that they can all be treated by corneal transplant, basically. Um, however, the estimated global demand for corneal tissue is around about 15 million patients and only about 1.4% of these, so that's 185,000 corneal transplants are being treated annually. And actually, um, corneal blindness disproportionately affects uh, low and middle income countries, countries such as India, China um, and those in the Middle East. So why are these corneas not reaching those, those in need? So basically, not all corneas from potential donors are collected for various reasons, uh, one of which is actually infrastructure reasons. Um, particularly in these low and middle income countries, there's a lack of accessible eye banking facilities and a lack of funding to be able to set up the infrastructure to collect corneas and get them where it's needed. Where we do collect corneas um, in this country and, and in the US, um, there's a limited storage time, much better than organs such as livers and hearts, is that we can collect them and store them for, for up to 28 days, um, but it's still limited. So they're stored in something called organ culture, which is, is how these images are on the side. Um, this organ culture requires a significant temperature control, either at four degrees or 37. It's dependent on the eye bank and the country. Um, and what this means is that if we want to ship corneas from a country with a surplus to, to somewhere that, where they're actually needed, um, there's quite an expensive logistical challenge because of the temperature. Um, so if we could develop an effective preservation technique, we would be able to increase the time that corneal tissue can be stored, allowing for the shipping um, at ambient temperatures, allowing for storage on hospital shelves, which is something we can't do at the moment, and basically just increase the global donor pool, not replacing donor corneas, just um, um, increasing the numbers. So, of course, I wouldn't be talking to you if we hadn't developed a solution to this. So we've been working a little while on a technology called low temperature vacuum evaporation. And what this produces is a, a dry preserved human cornea that is non-viable. And to do this, so that's the cross section of the cornea, we remove the epithelial and the endothelial cellular layers, the outermost and the innermost. And then we do a drying step where we use varying low pressures by applying a vacuum um, and this is different to freeze drying because there's no pre-freeze step and at no point does the cornea freeze so we don't get any freeze damage and what this leaves is there are still some cells in it but they are left encapsulated and non-viable and this is just an image of, of the product the dry cornea next to a rehydration solution that we, we've had to develop that controls swelling so the difference to fresh donor corneas is obviously they contain no living cells, but they're not decellularized because they still contain those encapsulated stromal cells. Um, they'll be supplied to surgeons in a dry form rather than the organ culture medium they're, suggest they're used to, and there'd be requirement of rehydration before any surgical use. The big difference is that you can store these dry for five years at the moment, could be longer, we've not tested for that long, um, at room temperature before they can be rehydrated and then used surgically. So down to the science. So what effect does drying have on these corneas compared to donor corneas? Um, so obviously when we dry, we take all the water out. So the weight of the cornea goes down and the dry weight is at about 10 to 20% of, of initial weight. 
And then we can apply our rehydration solution and the cornea recovers this initial weight within about two hours. It's at about 80% at one hour and some of the surgeons we work with have said that they're workable at one hour because there's a level of, of up and down in the weight anyway, depending on where it is. Um, so when we look at the, the structure, so we've done a bit of histology and, and a bit of immunohistochemistry and, and a bit of TM. In fact, um, the collagen structure, other than the cells from those two layers going, the collagen structure doesn't appear to change, neither does the glycosamine glycan. And the two membranes um, shown here by laminin are also still there. The TEM backed up with what we did looking at the collagen. So no significant change there. This is backed up when we look at transparency, when we don't see a, a change, collagen content and glycosaminoglycan content. So what happens to these stromal cells when we dry? Um, so we looked at cell viability and we did a kinetic assay of um, Presto Blue, using Presto Blue. And basically with a normal fresh donor cornea, which I've referred to as organ culture, you can see that there's a met metabolic activity that goes, goes up. With the dried and rehydrated, we don't see this. So there's no metabolic activity within this. So then we wanted to look to see whether the cells had burst. So we deliberately lysed the control, which is the lysed control, and then we looked at um, the dried and rehydrated. And we, we used LDH, which is a cytoplasmic enzyme that, that is released when cells burst. And we saw no significant release. And actually, when I bring up the TEM again that we've done, and, and we're doing a bit further onto this, you can see that the cells are still very much intact within that. So it appears they've just lost their metabolic activity, but are still encapsulated within the collagen structure. So we want to use these as transplants. So are they biocompatible? We did a little bit of in vitro work, um, seeding the three types of human cells on, onto these corneas. And basically, yes, the dried corneas, once they've been rehydrated, will support all three types of the cells. And then we've done a pilot study implanting subcutaneously in a rat dorsal flank, which is not ideal. We want to go on to doing, obviously, implants in the eye next. But what we saw was there was no significant immune rejection and the surrounding cells infiltrated the implant but, and did not form a capsule, which we, we, we thought was good news. Um, lastly, because it's a product and we need to get through the regulators, um, we can produce these aseptically, but they'd have a lot more confidence if we could use a apply a terminal sterilization method to this. So um, we've tried to use um, gamma irradiation as terminal sterilization on the dried corneas, and we've looked at different doses and the effect that it has on structure, opacity, collagen, and gag. And once again, at all doses, we've seen no significant effect on that macro structure. We need to look a little bit further into the microstructure. And we've looked at the proteins that are contained within the corneas, so um, some of the growth factors there. and. We saw a little drop off at 45 kilogram, but up to about 35, there was no significant effect on the growth factor content either, which is good news. But we do need to have a, a check to see that this actual terminal sterilization step does remove any of the bio burden that might be on these corneas. So how can they be used clinically? When you perform a corneal transplant, there's a couple of ways of doing it. So you can do a full thickness grant, graft where you replace basically everything of the cornea, or you can do a partial thickness graft, where you leave the host endothelium and replace partial of the stroma. And basically, these dried corneas are only really suitable for these partial thickness grafts. And this is because you need a living endothelium. It doesn't regenerate very well. So this is things such as lamella keratoplasties. Um, these are performed about 50% of corneal transplants, and um, surgeons actually sometimes prefer them because they're not touching that endothelium. So there's still very much a use there. It could also be used in an emergency, so as patch grafts before you um, go on to perform another corneal transplant, or as something like tectonic support, which is where the eye isn't doesn't work anymore, but um, you still want to keep the eye rather than replacing it with, with a false eye, and so it maintains the pressure. Um, so advantages, as I've talked to, are the access, which is mostly because of the stability of them and how metabolically inactive they are. And one thing I didn't say is, is that these could be affordable because we're talking about potentially using waste products, corneas that have gone past that 28 day storage time and maybe doing scalable cost effective manufacturing as well, which is what New Vision are working on at the moment. So in conclusion, we've developed this low temperature vacuum evaporation 
and we're using it at the moment to preserve donor corn ears. Um, the dried corn ears we have are similar to donor corn ears, and they are biocompatible and can be potentially terminally sterilized. The dried corn ears have potential utility in lamella keratoplasties, emergency situations in tectonic support, and most importantly, they can be stored on hospital shelves, shipped at ambient temperatures worldwide, so would increase the amount of corn ears we have in that global donor pool. Thank you. That's my acknowledgement to everyone that's helped. And if there's any questions, if there is time left, that was a lot of information for eight minutes. That was great, Laura. Thank you so much. That's a really innovative um, approach. And I think it, it's really nice to see to see the applications you have in mind. Um, in the interest of time, we need, we need to get a bit of a move on. I, I had a really quick thing to ask you, which was just, you mentioned um, the regulators and what happens next. And I just wondered, do, are you going to need to demonstrate equivalence to some current approach, or will it be sufficient to say, look, this is this could be used in situations where where the current approach can't be used? Do you know what they'd, they'd want to see? So, so obviously, yeah, we're, this is what we're working on a little bit with New Vision. So New Vision already have an amniotic membrane product that's dried similarly. And theirs is regulated through the Human Tissue Authority. And basically, all they had to do was go, it's the same as amnion that isn't dried or is frozen. So we're working with the um, HTA and the MHRA at the moment to really decide, is it okay to say these are just human tissue donor corneas, in which case it's the HTA? Or do we have to prove like a clinical? So we're working and it's head in the way that they're, they're being seen as human tissue. So if we can show through surgeons um, using them or even through the in vivo that they're equivalent to like donor corn ears, hopefully we can get through that way, regulatory wise. That's great, thanks. Because I think it's the kind of thing that actually a lot of people listening to this, working on all sorts of other approaches to, to repairing other tissues, uh, will be encountering similar situations. So that's that's great. Um, so I'm going to have to um, move on. There, there's questions appearing in the chat, but um, if Laura, if you if you could answer those in the in the in the in the chat or speak to the people, that would be great. Um, thanks ever so much for a great talk. Um, next up is Tom Bate from the University of Edinburgh. I'm hoping he's ready to go. He is ready to go. Um, Tom's going to be talking about comparison of donor variation in human liver ECM PCL electrospun scaffolds. Welcome, Tom. Hi, James. Thank you. Um, and uh, can we just have the slides up, please? Right. So hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about um, some of the work that I've been doing throughout my PhD, um, in particular with respect to uh, donor variation in human liver ECM PCL electrospun scaffolds. Um, so uh, yeah, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, keynote uh, speaker to kind of introduce the topic of my work. Um, Jonathan gave a, gave a great talk. Um, and so, yeah, we know that there's a, about a quarter of the, the global population have um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and this can lead to, to further liver disease such as fibrosis and, uh, and cancer. And we know that these conditions um, are generally characterized by changes in the structure and the composition of the, the liver tissue, and, and, and this affects the hepatocytes. And so we're working with electrospun scaffolds, and we've been looking at um, how, um, how structure and composition uh, can, can affect the, 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 the uh, culture of hepatocytes on electrospun scaffolds also. Um, so I'm just going to start off with some published work that we've done on uh, previously on uh, the structure of electrospun scaffolds. Um, and so we uh, electrospun uh, two sets of scaffolds. We electrospun small and large fibers uh, into three different um, morphological uh, categories. So we have these random, randomly aligned fibers, we've got aligned fibers, and we've got these cryogenic, more porous cryogenic uh, scaffolds. Um, which uh, we've seeded HEPG2 and primary mouse hepatocytes onto. Um, and so here you can see the cells and you can see how the fiber architectures have um, affected the, the morphology of the cells on the scaffolds. Um, and uh, our cell viability and DNA data indicated that there, were, there was more room for proliferation on uh, some of the scaffolds with larger pore structures 
uh, in particular looking at the large cryogenic we saw also large uh, higher levels of, uh, of cell attachment uh, within the wide pores um, and uh, we also did some uh, analysis on the gene expression um, and in both cell types and we saw that actually CYP102 was uh, quite responsive to um, scaffold architecture. Um, uh, and this is important because CYP-102 is one of the, one of the main metabolic enzymes uh, in hepatocytes. Um, uh, but interestingly, we didn't see the same patterns of responsiveness in other cytochrome P450 genes, uh, other variants. Um, uh, and so moving on from the, the structural work we did, um, uh, I'll move on to some of the work we've done with uh, human ECM. Uh, which is quite exciting um, and um, basically this is the method that we've been using to incorporate uh, human liver ECM into electrospun scaffolds with PCL um, and so um, we decelerized the ECM using an in-house uh, process um, and we've incorporated it into PCL electrospun scaffolds um, so we, we were wanting to compare the donor uh, the, the donor donor variability. So here you can see uh, five different liver tissues that we've uh, sourced. And um, on the top row, you can see the liver tissues. And on the bottom row, you can see the resultant decelerized ECM. Um, and I'm sure you can appreciate just uh, from a visual perspective, uh, that there's huge differences in, in the characteristics of each of the tissues, as well as the ECM. Um, so um, we confirmed decelerization by removal of the DNA content uh, down to around 100 nanograms per milligram um, for each of the tissues. Um, and we went further on to characterize the ECM uh, with some FTIR analysis. Um, and we've seen uh, in particular that the vibrational characteristic bands for uh, the carbonyl and the alkyl groups, um, we've seen quite large changes uh, in, in, these, in these peaks, uh, particularly in the kappa group. Um, and we thought this might be due to um, different levels of uh, lipid content. Um, and so we did some triglyceride analysis um, on each of the ECMs. Uh, and we saw that actually the kappa, I, I mean, I'm using Greek letters here to identify the samples, um, that kappa is, uh, has a significantly lower amount of, uh, of, of lipid content uh, residing within the decelerized ECM, um, or triglyceride more specifically. Um, yeah, it's worth noting that um, there's hundreds of components in these ECMs, uh, and so the differences we see in some of the FTIR spectra um, are probably due to, to variation in all of these, these hundred compo hundreds of components. Um, and so, yeah, we, we incorporated these uh, ECMs, each different ECM, into um, PCL uh, electrospun scaffolds um, with, quite, with a consistent uh, morphology. Um, and we found that the addition of different ECMs um, actually contributed to a different level of, uh, of stiffness that we've seen in our tensile testing tests. Um, and we also did some further DNA analysis on the final scaffold material. Um, and uh, we, we're showing uh, a, a DNA content of around one nanogram per milligram. So as we dilute the ECM uh, in, these, in these PCL structures, uh, we're seeing less of this immunogenic material. Um, and so uh, here I'm showing you some immuno, uh, immunofluorescence images that we took um, of um, staining for collagen, uh, fibronectin and laminin, which are some of the major ECM components um, found all over the body. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we've shown that these, these proteins are present on, uh, on the surface of the fibers, uh, albeit in, in, different, uh, in different quantities, I say, in each, uh, in each um, sample. Uh, yeah, whilst this isn't a, qu a quantitative uh, assessment, you know, at least qualitatively, we can say that there are differences. Um, but nonetheless, we can see uh, particularly that the, the proteins are present on the scaffolds. Um, and so, yeah, we, we went forward and we cultured some Hep G2s and also some uh, primary mouse hepatocytes again on these scaffolds. And here you can see the cells uh, with, the, uh, with uh, some Daphian uh, phylloidin staining. Um, and we did some cell viability and uh, DNA um, analysis on the cultures 
uh, and we saw that uh, actually the incorporation of different ECMs seemed to uh, have an influence on the proliferative uh, activity, at least of the HEPG 2s we can see down here in Zeta that we've seen, um, we're seeing much lower levels of uh, DNA increases over time. Um, and uh, with the primary mouse hepatocytes, we don't see huge differences because they're not um, hugely proliferative in our cultures. Um, uh, as Jonathan explained, you know, the primary cells regularly uh, proceed to apoptosis and um, we, uh, we, but we've not seen huge differences in the survival rates really. Um, and we've run some PCR at current on the HEPG2 cells and uh, we're seeing, uh, we've done some, uh, we've got some, uh, some ECM genes here with collagen 1 and fibronectin. In particular, we've seen uh, quite a differential expression across each of the groups for fibronectin. Uh, but with the cytochrome P450, these are the metabolic, some of the metabolic enzymes in the in the liver. We're not seeing huge differences between each of the samples. So um, yeah, just to conclude on what I've been talking to you today, um, we we've shown that electron scaffold structure can influence uh, some key markers of hepatocyte function. Um, different uh, donor human liver ECM um, can be electrospun into into consistent uh, structures. Um, and uh, donor variation, uh, we're seeing evidence that it can influence proliferation and uh, gene expression in hepatocyte cultures. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone who was involved in this work, particularly the Canon group, past and present, um, and also uh, my collaborators in, in the Forbes group, uh, particularly Dr. Victoria Gadd, who has uh, sourced the primary cells, but they've all been involved in getting, how, getting hold of um, these, these tissues. Um, and also my funding sponsors and NHS Blood and Transplant. Thank, thank you everyone for listening. That was great. Thank you very much, Tom, for a really, a really clear talk and some really exciting stuff going on there. Um, because we're short of time, what I'm going to do is, is if anyone's got any questions for Tom, can you just type them into the live Q&A and then Tom will take a look at those and, and he'll be able to answer them in the chat because we really need to press on. Um, okay. and thanks very much, Tom. So the talk is from Trisha Fitcranth from the University of Kiel. And Trisha is going to be talking about decellularized pleural membrane patches for prolonged alveolar air leaks. Welcome, Trisha. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. I hope I'm audible. OK, um, my screen should share shortly. Um, sorry, good afternoon everyone, I'm Trisha Vitrant and currently in the second year of my PhD at Kiel University and I'm looking to develop decellularized pleural membrane patches for management of prolonged alveolar air leaks. So prolonged alveolar air leaks or PAL are defined as persistent air leaks of the escape of air into the thoracic space uh, lasting for five days or longer. It's a common post-surgical complication following lung resections and biopsies at an incidence of 8 to 26 percent. The current clinical management uh, post-operatively is conservative with extended chest tube insertions and pleurodesis. However, they are often uh, associated with the development of secondary comorbidities in patients that include pulmonary and pleural infections and uh, acute inflammatory reactions. So what we are looking at is decellularized pleural membrane patches that can essentially function as an adjunct to the current intraoperative surgical closure techniques in reinforcing the mechanical barrier and fulfilling the clinical need in reducing the incidence and severity of PAL. From a tissue engineering perspective, I think it offers a novel treatment modality and also facilitating spontaneous uh, pleural membrane regeneration uh, following stimulation of the endogenous repair mechanisms in the patient. Uh, with that goal in mind, my three key areas of uh, research are essentially in deconstructing the pleural membrane, the porcine pleural membrane, wherein with cell culture studies, I'm looking to optimize an isolation and expansion protocol for pleural mesothelial cells that form the superficial monolayer on the pleura and characterize them in long-term culture. 
Secondly, as far as scaffold fabrication is concerned, I'm looking at deriving uh, EPM-based bioactive scaffolds through plural membrane decellularization and characterizing the efficiency of the protocol in terms of retaining the inherent biomechanical and biochemical characteristics of the membrane whilst stripping off the nuclear and um, cellular antigenic components. And finally, moving towards recellularization studies that will help, um, help us develop a proof of concept for the intended application of decellularized plural membrane patches in clinically. So this is just a schematic that represents the cell culture studies we had undertaken initially, wherein we looked at uh, two enzyme digestion routines, uh, pronase and trypsin at specific time points, and also conducted direct explant cultures of control. And secondly, went on to optimizing cell culture conditions in terms of media, where we looked at DMM with 10% SDS versus CFAB, which was uh, fortified with hydrocortisone and epidermal growth factor, carried on with routine cell culture practice and characterized our established cultures with light microscopy, uh, immunostaining, and estimating the population doublings at each stage. So what we um, came down to is that pronase digested uh, cell suspension cultures at 24 hours consistently gave us um, a mesothelial-like cell population in terms of uh, the cells assuming a cobblestone morphology, more reflective of the phenotype we are looking for, as opposed to trypsin-digested cultures that categorically generated a fibroblastic population. Um, there's a similar trend as far as cell culture uh, medium was concerned where DMM gave us a more fibroblastic appearance of cells consistently as opposed to CFAD uh, that gave us the cobblestone appearance that we were looking for. So we have narrowed down our isolation strategy to using pronase digestion and culturing them in CFAD media without rock inhibitor initially. Um, we extended our studies to uh, looking at long-term culture of these cells wherein um, initially when they were cultured without rock inhibitor and uh, assumed senescence or closer to senescence, we went back a few passages and um, introduced them and revived them in CFAT. Sorry, uh, let me go back. Sorry, so introduced them in CFAD media, but now containing rock inhibitor to see if we can expand the lifespan of um, these cultures, as well as look, characterize their morphology, population doublings, and marker expression profiles in long-term culture. And like we saw when, uh, uh, as seen here, uh, going back, sorry. So when we initiated the cultures at when we initiated the cultures at P19, now introduced with rock inhibitor, looked stringy and stroppy at first, but um, over passages with P21 and now currently at P28, assume the cobblestone morphology that we were looking for, and also um, evidenced with the population doubling levels that are showing an upward trend. Uh, Immunocharacterization studies was the next step where we looked at four relevant mesothelial markers in our established cultures, and gave us promising results with momentum staining positive for both at early stage at P4, as well as at late stage um, cultures. Um, mesothelin, which is more specific to mesothelial cells at the surface membrane protein, again, giving us positive staining at early and late stage, uh, followed by pan-cytokeratin and zona oxidans one, which also gave us positive results. Moving on from cell culture, which is, um, we looked at scaffold derivation, wherein um, we adopted a combinatorial approach of initiating cell lysis with uh, freeze thaw cycles and then treating the native PPM with a cocktail of surfactants and uh, nucleases. And we characterized our derived decellularized plural membranes with histology, nuclear membrane integrity analysis, and mechanical studies. So the pre preliminary results we got with um, histology, again, looks promising with H&E showing a visible reduction in the purple stained nuclei. We backed that up with quantitative evidence by carrying out uh, nuclei counts um, using DAPI staining. Uh, along with that qualitative analysis of specific ECM components, we looked at sulfated glycosaminoglycans with alkene blue staining and collagen with bicrociduous red. 
And what we observed uh, is that there's not major alterations to uh, or visible major alterations to the alignment and the intensity of staining. However, it requires quantitative assays to back up uh, in terms of estimating the content pre and post decellularization, as well as ultrastructural studies that can again confirm the retention of the alignment and organization of our ECM components. Finally, we went on to uh, mechanical studies where we initiated membrane thickness estimations uh, using an optical tensiometer. And what we derived as expected was an increased thickness of the membranes following decellularization. However, what was reassuring was the estimated Young's modulus of our derived decellularized membranes were comparable to their native controls, um, suggesting the protocol being um, or rather retaining the inherent mechanical properties of the native membrane, a prerequisite to efficient decellularization process. So building up on our current data, like I mentioned, need to um, carry on quantitative assays, essentially to look at the residual DNA content as well as the ECM composition and architecture. Um, secondly, we are looking to collaborate with a team that offers uh, a microarray platform to uh, carry out molecular profiling of our decellularized madrisome. And uh, with our final goal of recellularization and developing a proof of concept, I'm also initiating experiments to optimize the sterility and long-term storage of our derived membrane. And that's our team at Guy Hilton. Thank you very much, and I'm okay to take questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia, for a really clear talk and some really promising results coming through there. Um, if anyone has questions for Tricia, please put them into the live Q&A, um, and then they'll be dealt with um, through through that rather than um, live now, because um, we need to move on to our final talk of the session. Thank you very much, Tricia. Um, <clears throat> final talk is from Sarah Shafat from University of Sheffield. And Sarah will be talking about developing an estradiol 17 b 32 responsive tissue engineered vaginal tissue model for evaluating biomaterials to be used in the female pelvic floor repair. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm a PhD scholar working with Dr. Vanessa Hurden and Professor Sheila McNeil in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, University of Sheffield. Uh, over the past decade, Professor McNeil's research group in the Croto Institute has been working on developing potential materials for the female pelvic floor repair. The need of the R is to not only develop these materials, but to also develop better preclinical testing methods for these materials before they further go into animal studies. In this way, we can reduce the number of animals used in vaginal research. My project is mainly focused on developing an estradiol responsive tissue engineered female genital model for, in, for the purpose of in vitro studies on vaginal pathogenesis. And in the long term, we aim that these models could be used as preclinical testing methods for uh, potential biomaterials for the female pelvic floor repair. We all are very well aware of the obvious advantages of tissue engineered in vitro models over animal models and 2D cell culture in terms of their cost, the ethical concerns involved, their transferability to humans, and their reproducibility. While talking about vaginal research, the most commonly used animal mo models are the mouse and rat models, whereas rabbit is a model has been used as irritability testing models for newly developed uh, vaginal formulations. But here we can see uh, clearly see that uh, talking about the human uh, vaginal anatomy, the mouse and the rat models are very, very different from the human vaginal tissue. The, clo the more most closely resembled uh, vaginal tissue is of sheep and pig. Uh, in addition, we can see here the histological similarities and differences among different species. The human vaginal mucosa, it's a non-cretinized stratified squamous epithelium, which resembles with the sheep and the pig vaginal mucosa. But the mouse and the rat vaginal mucosa is a cretinized one, which is very different to the human vaginal tissue. These interspecies differences can lead to failure of uh, newly developed pharmaceuticals in later stages of the um, um, uh, clinical trials. 
Hence, in this project, we selected sheep vaginal tissue to reconstruct our in vitro uh, vaginal models. The broader objective of my project is to design a hormone responsive tissue engineered female genital model by using sheep vaginal tissue and primary sheep vaginal cells, which has endless possibilities in future. And we hope that we will be able to evaluate newly developed biomaterials for the female pelvic floor repair by utilizing these in vitro uh, testing uh, methods. The methodology I employed is very similar to the construction of dermal constructs. Here we receive intact sheep urine genital tract from the avatar. We dissect out the vaginal tissue from the intact tissue. Here we can see the shiny vaginal mucosa over the surface. This tissue is then used to isolate primary sheep vaginal epithelial cells and fibroblasts. A co-culture of these cells is then seeded onto the decellarized sheep vaginal tissue. The cultures are maintained up to three days in normal culture conditions, and then it is later raised onto the air liquid interface for stratification. Uh, these models are then uh, sacrificed uh, after three weeks to evaluate histologically and immunohistofluorescence analysis uh, was carried out. So these are the results of the decellarized sheep vaginal tissue matrices. For the purpose of decellarization, I employed two different methods. One is a combination of anionic and anionic uh, detergent method. Another is a combination of a hypotonic and detergent method. By the gross appearance of the vaginal tissue, we can see that after decellarization, the vaginal tissue was quite whiter in shape, uh, in appearance, as well as quite fragile to handle. These are the successful isolation of primary vaginal epithelial cells showing a typical morphological characteristics of cobblestone-like appearance and the vaginal fibroblasts. These images are the histological images of the uh, decellarized and native sheep vaginal tissue. Here we can see that after decellarization by both methods, there was complete removal of vaginal epithelium as well as no visible uh, cellular nuclei could be seen in the detergent method. With the picoserous red staining of the collagen matrix, we can see that there was adequate preservation of collagen uh, in both methods of the decellarization. But in terms of supporting the primary cell metabolic activity, the decellarized matrices prepared by the detergent method supported the cellular metabolic activity uh, greater than uh, greater than even the uh, 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 DED, which is the uh, kind of a standard decellarized matrix used in many tissue engineering applications. So we selected uh, our matrices from detergent method to uh, do further experimentation. After decellarization, the next stage is to recellularize our uh, in vitro vaginal models. These are the H and D images of the vaginal models in vitro after four days in culture. We can see the gradual reformation of vaginal epithelium over the lamina propria. And uh, in week three, we can see that the uppermost layers of the vaginal epithelium became more cretinized uh, as it progresses into the ALI culture conditions. But beyond three weeks, the vaginal epithelium started to detach. Hence, we can show that our uh, models survived up to three weeks under ALI culture conditions, and we can uh, perform our studies up to three weeks. In terms of the metabolic activity of uh, primary sheep cells over these um, constructs, uh, these are the uh, data from the Resazarian assay. We can see that the uh, matrices supported the metabolic activity up to week three. Uh, but beyond that, the metabolic activity started to decline as shown in the histological images. Once our uh, matrices resembled uh, the native sheep vaginal tissue, the next stage is to characterize these matrices in terms of their functionality. For this purpose, I used estradiol induction studies on tissue engineered vaginal models. We are well aware that estradiol is the main female reproductive hormone and has a main role in maintaining the um, vaginal epithelium uh, stratification, uh, its, its, structural, its structural integrity, and it is also responsible for the expression of key cytokeratins in the vaginal epithelium. So we employed estradiol induction studies on our vaginal uh, tissue, and uh, we observe how these tissues behave towards different concentrations of estradiol. 
So these are the HND images of uh, tissue engineered vaginal models in response to different concentrations of estradiol. Here we can see that a, do a dose dependent uh, response of vaginal epithelium towards estradiol concentration. We use uh, concentrations from zero, that is no estradiol, to uh, up to 400 picograms per ml of estradiol in the culture medium, which is therapeutically relevant. Uh, with the gradual increase in estradiol concentration, we can see that the, there was a gradual increase in vaginal epithelium thickness, as well as stratification. And at a concentration of 400 picograms per mil of estradiol, we can see that the epithelium was way too thicker, even thicker than the native vaginal tissue. Hence, we can conclude that the, uh, uh, our cells that were seated onto these matrices are responding towards estradiol in, in a, in a dose-dependent manner. The cellular uh, estradiol not only uh, supported the vaginal epithelium thickness, but it also supported cellular metabolic activity. With an increase in estradiol concentration, we observed an increase in cellular metabolic activity on these vaginal uh, constructs. The next stage is the immunohistofluorescence analysis of these tissue constructs in order to uh, determine cellular proliferation. For this purpose, we detected QI67 expression of uh, vaginal epithelial cells cultured on our models. Again, we can see a dose-dependent increase in signal intensity of QI67 on our models. Uh, th these uh, sections were counterstained with DAPI. Uh, the basal uh, cells of the uh, epithelium, uh, they expresses the QI67 in a dose-dependent manner towards estradiol with a higher concentration of estradiol uh, uh, triggering more expression of QI67 on our models. We also determined the cytokeratin 10 expression on our models, uh, that is the marker for stratification. B uh, with an increase in estradiol concentration, we observed an increase in uh, vaginal epithelium stratification in our models. Uh, these, uh, this marker is specifically um, uh, shown by the suprabasal um, cells in the vaginal epithelium. With an increase in concentration, the intensity of the signal increased for cytokeratin 10 expression in our models. We also detected cytokeratin 19 expression from our uh, models uh, by uh, immunohistofluorescence analysis. Cytokeratin-19 is specifically regulated by estradiol in breast tissue uh, in normal human uh, um, adult human, and uh, only a high concentration of estradiol trigger its expression in certain um, uh, tissues uh, in the human body. Here we can see that only the highest concentration of estradiol triggered the expression of cytokeratin-19 in, in, in the uppermost layers of the vaginal epithelium in our constructs. So these results, we can con from these results, we can conclude that our reconstructed vaginal tissue models, they show structural similarities with the native she vaginal tissue. Not only they show the structural similarities, but they also respond toward estradiol in a manner very similar that in native human tissue response, which is a positive indication that these models could be utilized for studies that are directed towards a human use, of, a, a, a direct, that are directed towards ultimate human use. The, our models are estradiol responsive in a uh, dose-dependent manner. And we hope that in future, these models could be utilized for preclinical testing of potential biomaterials that are designed for the female pelvic floor repair. For, with this, um, I conclude my presentation. Thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a, a really clear talk and a really promising model and um, <clears throat> some nice results coming through there. If people have questions, please put them <clears throat> into the live Q&A um, and, and, and Sarah will be able to answer them there. Now we're well into injury time now. So um, what I'm gonna do is, is wrap up. I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the speakers um, who presented in this session and to everyone who attended and for your questions and your attention, thank you very much. Um, thanks to the organizers and to the support team who've been um, working calmly behind the scenes to keep all of this running. Um, and please now um, join the final session, which is, which is gonna be a short um, closing session and, and prizes. Thanks very much, goodbye.